Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. What are the three keys to true negotiating success? Hello, everyone. Kevin Cruz here. Today, we're going to talk about authentic negotiating. But first, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter at LeadX.org. Each issue has actionable tips you can try out right away to advance your career and to fulfill your potential. Visit LeadX.org. Our guest today is an expert deal maker and business consultant with more than 30 years of professional negotiating experience as a successful entrepreneur and as an attorney. His new book, Authentic Negotiating, reveals the real internal work it takes to become a truly great negotiator. Our guest is Corey Kupfer. Welcome, Corey. It's great to be here, Kevin. Thanks for joining us. So we're going to talk about authentic negotiating in just a minute, but I want to start by asking a couple of questions that our listeners are always curious about. And the first is just this whole notion or debate even about work-life balance. Like, what are your thoughts on it, or do you have any tips for those who are trying to achieve it? Yeah, so I, I actually don't believe in work-life balance uh, in the way that it's that it's phrased. I believe in something called integration. So for me, work-life ba- balance was something I always struggled with because the way I saw it was it was like I have all these different areas of my life, my, my work, my family, my health, my personal life, my friends, and somehow I have to bring all this together, and it always was like juggling balls, and you're always dropping one. So about, I don't know, a dozen or 15 years ago when I shifted my conversation around that to the conversation of integration, where I didn't look at all the different parts of my life as separate, but instead – I looked at them as how do I bring it all together? It's one life, and how do I have it all be integrated? Everything shifted for me. So, for example, just to give you one quick example, um, if an integration move would be, hey, I'm only going to work with clients uh, that I really like, and as an entrepreneur, obviously, I have that luxury, uh, and I'm going to find out what their interests are. So now if they want to meet, we can go on a hike together or play golf together or do something else that I like. So now I get my exercise, my outdoor time, and my client all together. That's an integration move. Wow, that's a great integration move, and I bet deepens the relationship uh, way way better than just meeting across a conference table. Absolutely. So tell us about a time early in your career when perhaps you failed, and what did you learn from it? Yeah, so I was at a law firm um I was in my 20s. I was at a law firm. I, I actually made a bad choice, and it was just a miserable place to to work. Uh, the the partner I mainly worked for was uh, the guy, kind of guy who was just really unhappy in his life, and he would call me in every Friday to tell me what I needed to get done by Monday morning. And that was you know, whether there was really a true deadline or not. He just wanted you working over the weekend. There was another partner in the firm I remember threw a phone in an associate. And, <laughs> and, and, and for the younger people listening, remember, this was 1980-something. I'm not talking about a cell phone. I'm talking about a desk <laughs> phone. <laughs> so, uh, so it was not a good place. Um, but back then, especially, there was this conversation of, oh, you can't jump around to too many places, you know, you need to stay for, you know, several years or else your resume is going to look bad. So I I suffered through it. And um, what what happened was that, you know, I I was so upset and so angry about being there that I let it affect uh, like I had this passive aggressive kind of thing, you know, where where I make believe I was doing stuff. But then, you know, I I wouldn't uh, like the stuff that wasn't really do. I wouldn't do the part to tell me to. And after a year and a half, they said, hey, you may want to find another job, which is what they <laughs> did. In, uh, in, you know, that's how they fired you in law firms. They gave you a couple of, <laughs> couple of months to, uh, to find something. And in hindsight, I mean, there were the easy lessons like, hey, you know, to the extent you can control it, you want to work in a place with good people and you want to be happy. And, and you know, I, I do avoid negative people in my life and including clients. I don't represent them. Um, but the bigger lesson for me was some years later, I really got into Wallace Waddle's uh, writing from 1909 on the science of getting rich and the science of being great. And he talks about this concept of the advancing man. And what he talks about is whatever you do, whether you like it or you don't like it, whether it's a high level job or you're sweeping the streets, you do it great and you do it with pride and you put everything into it. And that's what gives you the opportunity to advance. Other opportunities will show up from that. 
And in those early years, I didn't really realize that, and I certainly didn't take that approach. Wow, that's uh, that's a powerful lesson, and it, it makes me think my my 16 year old daughter just got her first job as a as a hostess at a local restaurant, and she's you know learn, <laughs> learning what it's like to to be working for the first time. And that was something I told her. I said, Natalie, listen. I said she was talking about some of the coworkers, the waiters, the waitresses. And uh, I said, listen, whatever it is you're going to do, you know, I said, just try to be the best one at that, you know, try to be the best and great things, great things will come. And Corey, your book is Authentic Negotiating, Clarity, Detachment, Equilibrium, Three Keys to True Negotiating Success and How to Achieve Them. So this, this is the first time I heard the term. So how is authentic negotiating different than traditional negotiating? Yeah. So, you know, if you read most negotiating books or a lot of the trainings or the other resources or articles out there, most of them focus on tips, tactics, techniques, you know, counter tactics. When they do this, then you do this. And then there's always a counter tactics. There's a counter counter tactic, <laughs> counter tactic. It's a chess you know, game. And that's the focus of a lot of them. And, and some of them, frankly, are highly manipulative and really, really bad and just not, you know, uh, not ethical and not effective. And frankly, some of the tips at that level are good. You know, they're, they're useful, um, but they are not the key to true negotiating success. What 30 years of experience has told me is that there's a deeper body of work and a deeper conversation that you have to have. And the great negotiators do that deeper work. It's not just about the tips and tactics. Oh, that's great. And so these these um, clarity, detachment, and equilibrium, you said, are the three keys. So dive into them a bit. What, what Tell us more about those. Absolutely. So, you know, first of all, it's CDE. So it goes in order. It's easy to remember. <laughs> uh, and uh, so let's start with clarity, the C. So the first thing is, and I'm amazed. I mean, I, I, I do negotiations, you know, from small, you know, negotiations up to multi-million dollar deals. And I work with multi-billion dollar teams. So it's the whole range. And even sophisticated people often go into multi-million dollar negotiations without the level of clarity that they should, and certainly without the level of clarity that I work with them on. So what does it take to get clarity? One, there's the external research and preparation, uh, which, frankly, some people even skip on that. But, you know, it's the industry research and uh, researching the people on the other side of the table and the company and trying to figure out their objectives and all that stuff. But the part that people really skip on is the internal preparation work, which means that are you 100 percent clear on every single material term of the deal and what's acceptable to you and what's not on it and what's not and how they interrelate to each other. Um, and people usually don't do that work. And it takes it takes an inner body of work. And I have this test that I use just as an example for that, which I call true bottom line. So I'll give you a quick example. Let's say somebody says to me uh, they're selling their company. And I say, okay, well, you know, what, what do you want to get for the company? Well, I, I'd love to get $12 million for the company. Uh, okay, what will you take? Well, you know, well, $11 million will be fine. What's your bottom line? $10 million. That's, you know, that's the most, that's the least I'll take. And by the way, you can apply this if you're negotiating, you know, salary at a job or any other scenario. Uh, but in that example, I'll say to them, okay, so $10 million is your bottom line. Yeah, that's my bottom line. Okay, so let's assume we get a deal. That meets every other one of your criteria, right? The payment terms, they're hiring the employees you want, your consulting contract is perfect, everything. But the money, instead of being $10 million, is $9,999,999.99. And usually the client's first reaction is, well, come on, Corey, that's kind of ridiculous, just a penny less. (laughs) And then, well, what about a penny less than that and a penny less than that and a penny less than that? It's not a penny less or not a penny more or not a day more or, you know, obviously it applies to all the different terms. It's just easier to, to illustrate it in, in terms of money. Right. So that penny less illustrates that, you know, doing that. But what more about the detachment and the equilibrium? Yeah. So so once you get the clarity, then uh, the the next piece is detachment, the D. And what detachment means is that you need to be detached to the outcome of the negotiation. Now, if you and I are negotiating a deal or we're negotiating an employment contract, uh, you know, or, 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 or a situation or whatever it may be, I should probably have a preference that we get the deal done or else why am I wasting my time? But ultimately, I need to be detached to the outcome, which means that if I'm able to get a deal done with you on the criteria 
that I got clarity on. So it meets my objectives, I do it. And if I'm not able to, then I don't. And I'm equally okay either way. I'm not attached to the deal. And great negotiators always have that level of detachment where they're willing to walk away, but they're not walking away from a place of ego or anger or upset. They're walking away from a place of clarity. And that walking away looks more like saying, hey, Kevin, listen, I appreciate our time together. Uh, I was hoping we would get to a deal. Obviously, what works for me won't work for you. Maybe we'll be able to do something in the future. And what it means is that you're trusting that something else will show up or it's not the right time to do the deal. And you're also aware of the fact that it is the only thing worse than not doing a deal is doing a bad deal. And when it comes to equilibrium? Equilibrium, that's the third one. So equilibrium means being able to keep your center, your balance, um, being calm during the heat of the negotiation. So a lot of people, maybe they do their prep well, maybe they're clear on their objectives, uh, maybe they go in thinking they have an ability to be detached, and then they get into the negotiation and they get triggered. Whether it's somebody says, uh, you know, hey, you're not worth that salary, or, you know, we, we can't guarantee you that benefit or we won't buy your company for that amount or whatever it is, or they pull some manipulative negotiating tactic that gets you pissed off or they say something. So the key is in equilibrium is not to get thrown off by those triggers, not let your emotions, your ego, your upset, your feelings of scarcity or not being not good enough or anything that might trigger you that will throw you off. Because if you do that, you won't be able to stay connected to your clarity And you won't be able to remain detached. So being able to keep that equilibrium is the third key element. And and listeners, you know, just to to (laughs) use some some real world examples on this, uh, I so I sold my first company back in 97. I was about 30 years old and um, joined the leadership team uh, at, at this larger organization who then proceeded to buy 10 more companies in in a year. So I was part of the team that identified, acquired, and integrated these 10 companies. And it was anything from a couple million dollar size companies to maybe $15 million. And what I noticed over that year, our CEO did all the, the main negotiations himself. And I was always shocked that people were so excited early in the people who people really wanted to sell the company, their companies in. And then it would start to hit these roadblocks and I could see them getting more and more angry, more and more distraught, but they would always end up selling their company often at 20, 30% less than the original agreed upon price. And when I finally asked, um, you know, my boss at the time (laughs) to kind of coach me about what was going on, he told me what he was doing. And as I explain this, you can either take this and if you're a shark, you're going to use it against people or you're going to realize like, oh, my gosh, there are sharks out there. And I need to to remember Corey's words about being detached and equilibrium, being clear on the objective, because the CEO would would call up the young Kevin and say, hey, listen, we love your company. You're exactly what we've been looking for. Sell them the dream, sell them the growth and offer uh a higher than normal price valuation on the company to get a signed letter of intent. And then during the due diligence, what they call the due diligence phase, little things, the CEO would begin to nitpick little things. Oh, we didn't know you had one client account for 20% of your revenue. Well, now you're worth 10% less than what we told you yesterday. And over and over again, he would ding them down on their valuation. And I said, why don't they just walk away? And he said, Kevin, at this point, week by week, they've started telling their family and friends that they're going to sell the company. They've started shopping for their second, you know, vacation home or that, that fancy boat. And he says, it's, they've emotionally committed. And it's to the point where as mad as they are, and they lost their equilibrium quite a bit during these negotiations, at the end of the day, they'd rather still sell. Uh, but because they had not been clear on what that bottom line number was going to be. So he just kept knocking them down, 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 and they weren't detached either. So, Corey, I saw it over and over and over again, how people were losing in negotiations because they didn't have their CDEs all lined up. 
Kevin, it's, it's a great example that you gave, and I see it all the time. And you're right. I mean, you know, in those situations, a lot of them weren't clear on their bottom line, or some of them thought they were clear, but then, right, they fall in love with a deal, and they, they, they're already spending the money, you know, money, or they have the new lifestyle already. And um, it's you know, one of the things when I, when I train clients or represent them as a lawyer or, or train them in negotiating as a consultant, it's a lot of what we work on. You know, the deal's not done until it's done. And a lot of um, a lot of people will end up doing deals that if you ask them in the first place, would you do a deal on these terms? Their answer would be no. But they're so invested and they feel like they have money and time in and emotional attachment in that they end up doing a deal that's not that's not a good deal for them. Yeah, it's truly amazing. And, you know, it's easy to say like, OK, well, you got to remember to get to C, D and E. But that raises the next question, because this is really a, a you know, how do you how do you um, strengthen yourself psychologically like this to go into the negotiations? And I know and I love it that you're using these acronyms. So, you know, Corey, you you say you need to focus on your CPR. What is that? Absolutely. So CPR is context, purpose and results. Um, and. So let me take a step back. The first thing I tell people before we even get into the CPR tool is you should look at whatever you do that gets you into a place of, of clarity. So for some people, that's you know meditation. Some people, they go for a run. For some people, they uh, listen to music. So the first thing is going to a negotiation. Do whatever you know works for you that gets you into a, sort of a quiet and clear place. But then on top of that, I have this tool uh, that I uh, learned in, in, in a number of contexts that I've applied to negotiation called CPR. And CPR is context, purpose, results. What context means is that your state of being really counts in a negotiation. So I give an example in the book about a, a big uh, uh, team in a service business that had gone to a place they were really unhappy at. And they were going to go into a big negotiation to try to negotiate their way out of this deal. And they had bad legal agreements. They had non-solicits, uh, meaning they couldn't take their clients legally. So they were not in, in great shape legally. So they had to negotiate a deal. And their con and everybody has a context. They, you may not realize what it is, but basically they're on the phone telling me how horrible these guys are and how they were misrep you know, mis mis misrepresented uh, when they came in as to the terms and how these, you know, these guys were terrible people. And I said to them, listen, if you hold that context – what are the odds you're going to get a negotiated deal, which was important to them, and it was also important to them that there was a smooth transition for their clients? So if you're holding it out that these guys are jerks and they're, you know, uh, and they manipulated you and they lied to you, what's the odds of getting a deal done? And they realized that, yeah, the odds were not were not uh, high. So we work with them to shift their context on who they were being walking into the room. And for them, just as an example, they realized, OK, wait a second, we need to be calm. They were far from calm when we started, but they realized they needed to be calm. The other thing they realized they needed to be was patient. They were very impatient. They wanted to get out of there. But the truth was there was no inherent deadline on when they needed to get out. And they didn't have that strong leverage to start with. So the more impatient they were, the less chance they would have of, of being successful. And then they realized that they also needed to be they came up with the word firm because they these guys were tough negotiators and they didn't, although they wanted to be a patient and calm. And the other one, by the way, was collaborative. They knew they had to work with these guys. They also realized they needed something in their context that where they wouldn't get taken advantage of, where they weren't going to be pushovers. But they didn't want it to be words. They thought about words like uh, like, you know, aggressive, assertive. And those were more combative words. And that wouldn't have been a good context. So they came up with firm. So that's an example of shifting your context to a context that will put you in the best place and best way to be able to be successful in negotiating. And that's a context I usually use words like that, three or four words that you can true up back to if you feel yourself going off. This is great stuff. And again, listeners, this is the first time I've really heard this level of of you know deepness, the psychological angle when it comes to to negotiating. I often talk about. You know, we all have to be careful because our unconscious beliefs 
lead to thoughts, which lead to feelings, which often lead to action. And so, you know, what Corey just said is like, let's let's be mindful of what our beliefs are, what our state of being uh currently is and, and make sure it we shift it using these focus words into a place that's going to be more productive. And obviously that that's leading us to purpose, right? Yeah, absolutely. So so the purpose is a lot of people, right, they go into the negotiation and they're not 100 percent clear on what their purpose is for the overall negotiation or what their purpose is for that particular negotiating session. You know, some larger negotiations are done in multiple sessions. So you may you may, um, you know, have a purpose for that particular session. So going back to the example that I used in the book for this team of service people that were negotiating out, um, it took them a while to get to their purpose. I mean, they knew they wanted to leave, you know, but being like getting out of there or, uh, you know, being back in their own uh, uh, business or going somewhere else were things they wanted to do. But it wasn't the core purpose of what they were doing. And really through a process that I take my clients through. They came to the realization that their purpose was to get their freedom back. Now, think about that. I mean, for me, that sort of resonates even with me. But for them, when they were in that situation, right. uh, like the purpose has to be really something where I remember when I was working with both of them, they were both like, yes, that's it. You know, when they came to it. And so what, what the great part about determining your purpose is, And by the way, a lot of times we actually determine purpose first. And then ask our question, what is the context we need to hold okay. to be able to achieve that purpose? Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily go in CPR order. Right. Whichever way works for you works. But a lot of times I find people determine the purpose first and then go to, to the context. So for them, they said, yeah, get my freedom back. So now what that purpose allows you to do is to ask yourself the question all the time. Hey, am, is the next thing I'm going to do, the next thing I'm going to say, going to move me closer to my purpose? or further away from my purpose. And it gives you, again, that guide, you know, that sort of North Star that right. you can work towards. Fantastic. And then how do you focus on, on the results? Is this just another way of being clear on your objectives, or do you mean something else? Yeah, no, I mean, the results are actually the, the, the most understandable and easiest part of what people are used to, which is those spe spe specific measurable results you want to get out of any given thing, in this case, the negotiation. Um, the issue is most people... You know, if they do any kind of prep, some people don't even do this, but most people, you know, they'll, they maybe they'll list the results they want to get, but they're not clear on the purpose behind those results and they're not clear on the context they need to hold in order to get them. So their odds of achieving them, yes, it is important to be clear on the results. It's important to be able to, you know, have that present, but the odds of achieving them, if you don't have this, the, uh, uh, the, the C and the P part with just the R are much lower. Yeah, this is great. And, and I could see, Corey, I mean, speak to a little bit, you know, um, we talked about uh, my experience as a business owner who, you know, has exited a couple of times and uh, some of your cases. But does all this apply in the same way if, let's say, I'm, you know, I've, uh, I'm going for a new job at a new company and they said, hey, we want to offer you the job. And then there's the offer letter and it looks like I'm going to have to negotiate my salary a little bit differently. Right. I don't like their first offer. Does all this stuff still apply? Absolutely. I mean, everything that we just talked about and everything in the book could be applied to salary negotiations, buying a home, negotiating at the flea market. I mean, you any kind of negotiation that you're in. Car dealership. Um, let's not forget about them. Car, car dealership. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'll give you a funny story there. My first car that I ever bought on my own, a uh, new car, um, I, you know, I went into the I was, you know, went to a few different dealers. And, you know, I was just calmly, and this is before I really even developed, uh, you know, this, this whole theory and whatever, but I somehow, you know, knew it back then subconsciously. Um, you know, I'm 20 something years old and I went back and forth through a few dealers and, and I just, you know, was calmly just comparing them. And, and, uh, and at one point, one guy says to me, I said, you know, the other dealer will, you know, do it for 20 bucks a month less. And the, and the, the guy says to me, you mean you're going to, you know, you're going to undercut me for, for 20 bucks a month, you know? Uh, or 10 bucks a month or whatever it was. And I, and I looked at it very calmly and I didn't mean this in a side way. I just really was clear on it. I said, well, why wouldn't I? I mean, <laughs> right, we, right. We, we have no relationship. <laughs> it's a commodity. Like he's selling me the same thing. I mean, you know, why wouldn't I? So I wasn't attached to, um, you know, to, 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 to looking good in front of him or not upsetting him or now, by, by the way, that's a very different negotiation than when you're doing a negotiation, for example, in an employment situation, where you're going to work together with the people going forward. Right. 
Um, you know, I try to maintain relationship in any kind of negotiation, but certainly, you know, with a, you know, with somebody I have no ongoing relationship with and whatever, I, you know, I may approach it a little differently, like with a car salesman than I would in a uh, employment negotiation. Makes a lot of sense. So as a final question, Corey, you know, I like to challenge our listeners to become 1% better each and every day. But what's something that you can challenge them to do to try out, whether, you know, it's at work or in some other area of their life? Yeah, so I, I'm going to uh, give them something that can be applied in negotiation, but it really could be applied in any situation where there's any kind of upset or anger or frustration. So if you, you know, if you have an, an issue with a work colleague or a boss or in your personal relationship, uh, uh, you can use this. Um, so anytime that you get upset, frustrated, angry, triggered in any way, one, stop, take a breath and use that as a signal that something's going on and you might not be in the best frame of mind to make that next statement or take that next action or certainly return that email right away <laughs> without thinking. Right. Um, and what I will recommend is that you ask yourself one of two questions or both of these questions. So the first question that you can ask yourself is, will this next action move me closer to my objectives or further away? It's sort of like, uh, I, you know, I said with regard to purpose right. and negotiate, but you can use it in any situation. So if you're working on a project at work with a, uh, you know, with coworkers, with a team and you have some issues with one of them, um, when you're in a potential dispute or upset situation, but, you know, you have the project and, and it has a deadline, you want, you may ask yourself, hey, will this move us closer to getting the project done or not before you reply or respond to decide the action that you're going to take? That's really useful. The other question that I find is Usually useful in those situations. I often ask my activist friends, which I consider myself one of, who are like in, you know, believe in causes and they want to uh, make a difference in the world, this question, but can apply in any of these situations. And that is, do I want to be right or do I want to be effective? Mm. Right? Do I want to be right or do I want to be effective? And what happens a lot of times, and we're all human, it happens to me still, no matter how trained I am <laughs> in this stuff. Um, you know, it's easy to get in the place we, you know, where you want to be right. I mean, this last, you know, election is a great right, place right. where that showed up, right? Uh, on, on all sides. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, being right comes from a place of ego, comes from a place of, you know, your own identity. It comes from a place of, uh, from places that are not actually very useful. Um, and when you feel that coming up, if you ask that question, do I want to be right or do I want to be effective? It really has the opportunity to shift because what you would do and not do to be effective is often very different to what you would do and not do, you know, in terms of being right. Powerful questions to ask. I mean, it's uh, make sure you're clear on your purpose. I, uh, I'm going to remember this Corey. next time I'm, I'm getting ready to argue with my girlfriend on a Saturday night. I'm going to remember the <laughs> purpose of Saturday night and I'm going to choose my words carefully to, to stay on purpose. <laughs> That's right. Do you want to, do you, do you want to be right and sleep on the couch or do you want to be effective and have a good relationship? <laughs> exactly right. So Corey, what's the best way our listeners can find out more about you, your company, your book? Sure. So um, the website is Corey Kupfer dot com. Uh, I'm at Corey Kupfer on Twitter. Basically, I'm Corey Kupfer on all the social uh, media platforms. Um, the, the, the book's out early February. So I think by the time people will hear this, it'll probably be out. They can pick it up on Amazon uh, and, and, you know, and, and elsewhere. And the other thing I'll mention is if people pop onto my Facebook um, uh, fan page, the author page, uh, I'll be doing these Facebook live authentic business uh, uh, sessions once a week, uh, talking about authentic negotiating and building authentic business relationships and a bunch of other stuff. So people can check uh, when those are coming out on my on my Facebook fan page. And I'd love to meet the community and uh, say hello to people there. Free education and a great way to, to connect with like, like minded folks. Thanks, Corey. Welcome. All right, friends, you've just been mentored by expert, authentic negotiator Corey Kupfer. Check out his new book on Amazon.com or your favorite bookstore. You can get links and show notes from this interview over at LeadX.org. And don't forget, if you got even one new idea from this show, go leave an honest one or two sentence review up on iTunes because the more reviews that a podcast gets, the more likely it is that iTunes will show it off to others. Until next time, remember, you don't need a title to be a leader. Leadership is influence. How are you going to lead today?